Um, I'm part of a larger team. Um, sometimes we're known as the Englishman, the Irishman, and the Scotsman. And I'm not sure what the tag is Scottish or English, so it's probably a bit of a split on that one as well. So it's myself, obviously, um, doing a little dulcet Sussex voice, but I'll try and boom it for you. Um, and then Stephen Krimmer was my researcher, and he's now a man uh, with Jesus. Uh, Lindsay Patterson was part of our team from the University of Edinburgh, and also Stephen Tag from the Marketing Department at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, we had some funding from the uh, Future of the UK and Scotland, uh, and was supported by the Applied Quantitative Methods Network. And we did look at several different projects, and I'm going to focus on one today, but I'm going to let you know about all the things we worked on, so that you can ask me questions about some of those things if you're not interested necessarily in what I'm going to talk about, but hopefully you will like what I've picked to talk to you about today. I could talk for about two hours, but I've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to pick one of them. Uh, I've got Twits on Twitter, and I thought we'd look at that one, and to look at the extent what was going on on Twitter, and how good was it, how bad was it, and we looked at the hashtag IndieRef with that one. But I can also talk about, we took um, some social media comments and we looked at to what extent does that actually alter people's behavior. So if we, um, so we included those in an experimental survey design to see if it actually altered people's, how they might vote, uh, or what they think about the independence referendum. And then uh, you might have come across some of the work we did on um, we went and launched on several places, but mainly on uh, what Scotland thinks. John Curtis's um, website, uh, site on public opinion polls, we did stuff on who was ahead and who was uh, behind in terms of Twitter and Facebook for the uh, Yes and No campaigns. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about that uh, as well. We also did, well, we didn't just look at Twitter, we also looked uh, at the main grants to look at the BBC's How You Say Threads, um, which allowed a slightly longer uh, time slot to contribute on, and we looked at the content on that across 2012 and 2013 uh, in the run-up to the referendum. So I'm going to talk about Twitter on Twitter, but if you want to know about any of the other things, I'm happy to talk about those as well. Um, so the tweets on Twitter, we want to know, you know, are there tweets on Twitter, and or was it really quite good, and there were too many tweets on Twitter, and can it be a deliberative forum? So I'm going to spell out what I mean by deliberative forum, and we're looking for whether it had components thereof. We know the referendum took place on the 18th of September. We know that every now and then, and we've seen it since then, there are little spikes, whether it's, uh, you know, Nicholas Sturgeon or whether it's JK Rowling, there can be some vile tweets out there that all of a sudden surface and one person seems to be the target of those vile uh, tweets. Um, so we, we took a slice through uh, on the, I'll tell you a little bit more about the data in, in a minute, but I'll just preface it. You obviously know, that most of you probably know that Twitter, you've got 140 characters and then you run out, so there's not much space to, I couldn't believe the debate the other night, because half of the, by the time you type the hashtag, there's very little space left to write anything. There's very little moderation on Twitter. I mean, you can block people and you, know, you can get, but it's, it's not as moderated as, say, the BBC's have your say threads, where there are strict rules and moderators' rules about what you can and cannot say before you're removed. We also know that there's lots of research out there, particularly on um, not necessarily politics. I think in politics it's increasingly being researched, but there's a lot of research out there. The Jane piece, for example, looks at cheerleaders and the abuse that they get online from other uh, females uh, who write nasty things about them or whatever else it might be. Cyber apartheid. Uh, Putnam came up with this idea, and it's a really interesting book called Bowling Alone. Um, and this was the idea that very few people, it's almost like there's, a, there's some people who are on Twitter and there's a lot of people who are not. So we know from at the end of December 2013, uh, this, is from, this is Twitter data, the Rose works for Twitter, and the figures they have were about 25% of people um, have a Twitter account, um, and <coughs> the extent to which people actually use that Twitter account. Some people are Twitter users, and some people are Twitter voyeurs. So some people will use it, and some other people will use it to read it, but not take Part. So some people, you know, there's an interesting stuff going on there too. But it is still a minority activity, and the argument here is that there's some kind of apartheid going on where some people are, are aware of what's going on, and some people are not aware of what's going on. You could argue that that's indirectly people will still hear about Twitter because often if something is very important on Twitter or if it's really vile, then the media pick up on it, and then even if you're not on Twitter, you hear about it 
on STV or you hear about it on BBC or somewhere else. We know that Twitter is important, um, even though it's only got 25% of people using it. We know that it's important from the Irish presidential election, and there's some really interesting uh, research by Hogan and Graham, who looked at the agenda setting role. There was, there was a debate, they had debates in Ireland, and there was uh, somebody tweeted in, and the, the presenter used this tweet as it came in. And it was, you know, it was designed to derail one of the uh, campaigns in Ireland, and it had a huge, it arguably cost one of the presidential candidates uh, the election in uh, 2011. Um, we also know, and I mentioned this point before, there's indirect consumption of Twitter. So you might come across it even if you're not using it because other media forums are reporting it. Um, it's less rehearsed, it's more real, and I think that some people really like that. They like seeing politicians. Uh, or campaigners in, 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 a, in a light that's not corporate or composed, uh, there's a kind of realness about it. So in that sense, it, it arguably increases support for candidates if they use it effectively, and increases support for people who use it and try and uh, mobilize campaigns. We know there's uh, quite a bit of research, certainly in terms of participation, and Barack Obama's is probably the, 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 the Barack Obama campaign from 2008 onwards, we see uh, the capacity for the mobilisation of the vote, uh, mobilisation, getting people out to get supporters, to get funding, to get people out there. Uh, and so and I think certainly with the Scottish um, uh, referendum, that was very important too, to mobilise uh, people, get them out on the street, to get them involved uh, in different events. Um, I think it had much more of an effect with, on the yes side than it did on the no side, but Increasing participation, it, you know, it's, it's important in that sense. We also know that it can be used to predict election results, and uh, there is some research out there that suggests that if you watch what's happening with the Twitter trends, that you can predict what's going to happen. Now, our data suggested big swings towards yes. The polls weren't showing that, and everyone was telling me, "Well, what are you coming up with?" There's no swing to yes, and your data must, you know, your data, it means that Twitter's not that important. But I think we were picking it up before it actually happened. Um, and then all of a sudden the, the, the polls came later after some of the data that we got. So I think we've got some interesting precursors and it'd be interesting to see some of the patterns on Twitter in this election as precursors to what might happen in public opinion, with public opinion poll data later on. So I think you have to look at the two of the movements across the two just to look at what might be going on. Obviously, you could argue it's an unrepresentative 25% um, plus. It's also unrepresentative in the sense if one side takes part and the other side does not. Um, we wanted to know to what extent it has these deliberative features. So we're interested in the representation of diverse opinions. So we want to know, and we measured this by looking at the extent to which everybody who was taking part in the Ref got involved. Were there some voices who were much uh, greater than others, or was everybody kind of an equal-sized voice? We wanted to know about um, in-depth discussion. That's another feature of deliberation. So we wanted to know if people had in-depth discussion in the sense that they were providing links to government documents, to the white paper, to uh, statistics to support what they were saying. Uh, information exchange is sharing of web links, sharing of we're all meeting in George Square or wherever else it might be. Uh, openness to change. Uh, one of the key features of deliberation is that you would come along, you might have a view in your head already, and then at the end of the day you listen to all the debates taking place online, taking place in the media or do reading materials, and then you would change your mind. And certainly in a deliberative forum, uh, a deliberative forum would be, you know, you'd have a, maybe one side would get half the time, the other side would get the other half of the time, and you'd work out at the end of the day which side you believed in. So we wanted to know to what extent Twitter had that capacity to do that kind of stuff. And you could argue Twitter's not really set up for deliberation, but we wanted to know, well, how good is it at being able to do that kind of stuff? Uh, that is often seen as the ideal way of taking part uh, in uh, civic society, being involved in the polity. Also, politeness and civility. Um, uh, deliberation should take place in a realm in which everybody has kind of an equal voice and no one side trumps the other or uses foul language to win an argument or whatever else it might be. So these are the kind of things we're going to look at. Cyber organisation. You probably come across this when you're on your computer. Um, this always happens to me when I've just bought something in Amazon, some music or something, and then it says, thank you for buying this. People like you also bought Cliff Richard or whatever else it might be. And if you, then you wonder about your purchase that you've just made uh, or whatever else it might be. Do they all buy this kind of stuff as well? Am I getting old? 
what is that? Um, so, um, and there is a sense in which what might happen, and I think this is very important for the quality. I, I've done a video on um, YouTube on social media as well, and one of the things we've done for uh, we put together we had put together schools materials on how to use and engage with the uh, internet, and social media. And one of the core things that came out of that was this idea that people might often just consume what suits them, and they'll only go for the thing that they will they'll pay attention to. They won't consume everything that's out there and see all the different arguments and then make an assessment based on all the different consumption choices. It's a bit like when you go shopping for shoes, you want the, you want the best brand at the cheapest price. And if you're like me, you'll go to every single shop until you find the best pairs of shoes and you know you've got the best deal in town and you won't just go to the first shop and do that. Sometimes, you know, you've got the loyalties going on and whatever else. But the idea here is that you should be open to diversity of opinions, but that the literature suggests that online you might actually be uh, encouraged to view the same thing because the computer program, the algorithms, they'll force you to view the same things that you might like and you're not forced to view things that you might not like. Uh, and therefore it's up to us to break out of the, the computer's mold and think beyond and outside the box. But what we thought here was that because we were looking at hashtag IndieRef, uh, and when we were looking at this to begin with, we were looking at this a year before the launch of the white paper, um, and it did look like there were lots of different voices on hashtag IndieRef, and we thought that you know, there were a lot of opinions there, there was going to be a lot of exposure to a lot of different um, voices. We might expect, the literature suggests, that there is low reciprocity. There's very little space on there to, it's like when I was, I've tweeted today about this event, and then when I tweeted it, I thought, oh, I haven't mentioned two wonderful uh, people here who set up the whole event, so I didn't mention Christian, I didn't mention Ezia, and I, but then I thought, well, it's all right, they'll, they'll know, because you only have about nine, nine characters left, so I didn't actually have time to put them in. But there's very little space for reciprocity. I think that's one of the issues with Twitter. So we might expect, there to be very little uh, space to reference people and very little reciprocity. So you, there's very little, you can't, you don't often uh, mention other people because there's just not the space to do it. In-depth discussion, obviously we might not expect there to be in-depth discussion. And what, why, one of the reasons we wanted to look at the BBC's Have Your Say Threads is they enable you to have a slightly longer space to communicate in. And we wanted to juxtapose the Twitter with the Have Your Say. And I can talk a little bit more about that. And, but here we were just measuring because we had to find some way of measuring it. We thought about the inclusion of web links, the inclusion of statistics, and some way of showing that there was some kind of in-depth discussion or someone had thought about it and found something where they were trying to persuade others or show others something that was substantiated by someone. Now, flaming behaviour, I talk about this a lot on the TEDx video that I did on, online. And if you just type in my name and TEDx Glasgow, you'll get a link to that. And we were looking at flaming behavior. And in this particular paper, we measure flaming by looking at profanity. So I used all the regular English words and then ended up with, well, I'm on camera, aren't I? But it was the one that starts with P and ends in H. And that's a Scottish term. So it was kind of from the high down to the low, the brow, but in terms of the high hitting swear words to low hitting swear words. And then all the Scottish variants thereof. So we looked at that. We looked at excessive punctuation. Do people use more than one exclamation mark, more than one question mark? Do people use um, uppercase uh, punctuation? You know that shouting? You know when someone sends an uppercase email, you know you're in trouble? Um, so we looked at that, and then we looked at uh, whether people were negative about people's nationalities. So did people say nasty things about the Scottish? Did people say nasty things about the English? And then we looked at Godwin's Law. Does anyone know Godwin's Law? Uh, Godwin's Law is where someone, the debate, well, the, the, it's, a, it's a law that says the longer a debate goes on, the more likely it is that someone will use Hitler to try and win the argument. So they will try and <laughs> shut the debate down by saying the opposition is just like Hitler or just like the Nazis. And that's what they'll try and do, to try and close the debate and win it. And then eventually that's just, the longer a thread goes on, that's going to happen. So we were looking out for Godwin's Law to see if that was happening on the day of the launch of the White Paper. Um, the tweets that we got, we captured um, 5,043, and half of these were retweeted for hashtag IndieRef. Now, it was between 1 and 7 p.m. on the 26th of November 2013, so we did just, we went deep. We went deep in this analysis, but we just took a slice. A lot of other people look at patterns across wider data, but it's quite high and low surface 
analysis, but we wanted to go in deep and look at the quality of what was going on with some of this research, hence why I'm part of this uh, panel. And um, we also thought that, I mean, this was a heated day as well. This was the day, uh, you know, Nicholas Sturge and Alex Salmon were at the Science Centre launching that white paper. I was there in the morning. I was, everyone was there in the morning on that uh, south side. And the, I know it was a heated day because our phones took off at work. Uh, the moment John Curtis goes on TV, the, the poor girls in our office, they get all the phone calls and everything else, and then my phone gets going and everything else. And some people think I'm a yes voter, and some people think I'm a unionist. And I, my, my role is to just report what I find, and it's just nice. I keep a tally of how many people think I'm a no voter, and how many people think I'm a yes voter, and I think I'm about even. Uh, but you get it, I know this was a juicy day, because it did kick off and my phones were going, have I got five minutes, I'm running on. Uh, there are limitations, it is just one day's data, and I'm going to show you what, it's just a, it's just a flavour of what's going on, and I'm going to show you what we found. And we did do content analysis, and we did check that content analysis with 10% of the sample. So I had to check my researcher's coding, and then my researcher had to check uh, his coding as well, a subsequent day, to check that he wasn't in a bad frame of mind, and that he could do the same stuff again and again. You'll see here that basically what this, what if there was, equal inclusion. We would expect there to be, what we've got here is very few people taking part just once. A lot of people just posted once. There are a lot of people, a few people here, the 21 plus, who are really in there going for it. It's like they're non-stop tweeting away constantly. You know, their little fingers going. And so it would suggest that, um, you know, it's not only that good in terms of everybody being taking part equally. Some people take part a lot more than others. And some people just don't take part, some people just take part once, a lot of people just take part once. Do people reference other people? 89% of the time people do not. So they don't often, sometimes that's automatically happens when you reply to somebody or when you respond to somebody, but oftentimes it's just people giving their point of view and then someone else gives their point of view. They're not thinking about what, they might be thinking about what someone else is thinking, but when you're actually reading these tweets, it doesn't look like they're referencing anybody. So there's a low level of reciprocity on Twitter. Um, is the tweet retweeted? It's about 50-50, it's about so there was a lot of people, someone had written a really good tweet, you just retweet that one, uh, I might type it out again, it's quite nice, I'll just retweet it during a, a time when people might be paying attention, my lunch time, you know, sit around, everyone, it's amazing, the people who really know how to use the Twitter well, they'll go, I'll retweet that and I'll come back at like noon, when everyone's just got, when they're just down tools and they've got the soup in the microwave, and I'll just, you know, pop that one in there, so some of that was going on. Uh, does the tweet include a web link? This was huge. About 40% of people include, include a web link. And I think this was very much to do with the day. It was the launch of the white paper. And what a lot of the discussion about on Twitter was about is how can I get hold of a copy of the white paper. So this was people providing information about where to go to get the Scottish Government's publication uh, about um, the future of Scotland under independence. Does the tweet contain statistics? Um, very few did, so about 2% contained any kind of stats at all. Um, so a lot, a lot of people were not including any statistics in the tweets that they were putting in. Did any policy issues get mentioned? And this is the one big difference between Twitter and the BBC's Have Your Say Threads. There's a lot more policy discussion on the BBC's Have Your Say Threads, very little policy discussion on Twitter. It's normally about what people think about Salmon, Sturgeon, what they think about Cameron, Osborne, or whatever else it might be. It's often quite personalized and focused on um, what people are wearing, haircuts, and uh, what they just said, and the miniature. It's not often focused on specific policy issues. Was it civil? We found it was quite civil. Two minutes. It was quite civil, very few um, uppercase capitals, very little exclamation marks and question marks. The blue is the no, so the green is where there is a lot of this stuff going on. So very little um, going on with the question marks and the exclamation marks, and then very little uh, anti-Scottish here going on, about 1% going on, and then even less anti-English is going on, it was 0.2%. So, and these were quite explicit, you had to be really quite anti-Scottish and anti-English before we could, we would cope that as such, because some of it was, uh, you know, uh, and I'll explain that in a bit, uh, if you want to ask more about that. Godwin's Law didn't find anybody on this particular day talking about Hitler or the Nazis in this particular segment. 
Um, so that was pretty good. Did it contain profanity? No, it did not. Now, oftentimes, that little green segment is what we hear about on the TV. Someone would have done something bad, and we would think that the whole of Twitter is really bad. But probably it's quite small. Sometimes it does spike on a certain day. Um, it didn't spike on this particular day. So my conclusions are uh, negatives of Twitter for deliberation. There's a lack of equality of voices. Some people tweet an awful lot more than others. Uh, only a minority of people uh, reference other people, which suggests that they're paying attention or they're replying and thinking about what other people are talking about, which is one of the features of deliberation. Only a minority of people raise issues. Only a tiny minority report statistics. So those things don't look good for Twitter in terms of deliberation. But the positives of Twitter for deliberation are there were lots of sharing of information via the retweets and the web links, and there was very little bad behaviour going on online. Now I went on TV once and talked, there was very little bad behaviour going online. Somebody that I then I thought, I'll just check the tweets to see what people say about me. And it was like Shepherd laments the fact that there is not enough swearing, <laughs> which was not what I had said at all. But then you go to work and everyone else who didn't watch the programme says, Well, why did you, why did you lament it, Mark? Do you believe everything you read on Twitter? Uh, you know, it's, uh, but then we found very little of that flaming behaviour going on. Um, so the main problem is really that it's a bit too short. It would be nice if it's a little bit longer and it's still used by a minority of people and it's still used by some way more than others, which might arguably put some other people off from taking part. I probably abused my, that's my very last slide, the health warnings. The data is not random, it's a product and a context, and it's a deep capture of one moment in time. But we thought it was an interesting moment in time, a very important moment in, in time during that long campaign. Um, it could be worse elsewhere, depending upon the day, and it could have been worse on hashtag vote no or hashtag vote yes, where maybe it was more a cacophony of one side getting. What happens with the theory is that once you're on your own side, you all get carried away with it on whichever side you're on, and then it gets even worse, both on indie rep, you think. Well, I've actually got the square off with Mrs. Jones down the street who doesn't think like me, and I know she's going to be on there, and other people better be very careful what I say. So there might be some of that going on that we didn't capture. I've overused my time, but thank you very much. And next up we have. Um, <laughs>